The Final War Earth has been scoured by super science aether bombs in the conflict between the Unified Nations Security Confederation and the zealous red poison mutants of the Covenant. Our home has fallen, headquarters is lost, our generals are long dead, and the dire horde at our gates seek to bring about the end of humanity. But heroes have risen. Alchemically enhanced soldiers take to the front lines in their incredible Eagle Strike armor, leading the charge and doing their part against our relentless enemy. It is with these intrepid heroes, the Sky Marshal Astro Rangers, led by Commander Colby, that the fate of humanity will be decided. Original story written by Alex Wakeford and the franchise writing team of 343 Industries. We thank 343 for continuing to tell grand stories within Halo's universe and dedicate this series as a love letter to their efforts. Jumperscape Audio proudly presents Stories from Waypoint. Episode 1 The Last Sky Marshal Posted first on Halo Waypoint from June 14th to October 25th, 2022. Ten forty five hours, November third, sixty seven AP. SCS Brisingaman approaching construction dome on Luna. This is it, Sky Marshals! End of the line! Those mutant freaks have taken everything from you! Your home, your leaders! The only support you have are your brothers in arms standing beside you! No matter what, Project Perpetua must not fall into their hands! 300 must stand between them and their prize! The mission was simple. The Covenant, zealous cultists who became warped abominations as they were mutated by the irradiated trenches and poison mires of Earth, had discovered an abandoned cosmodrome with functional off-world transport. Arriving at Luna, they reignited the dormant atomic piles to complete construction of Project Perpetua, a massive zeppelin that was in the process of being built in the earliest years of the war. Corporal! Would you please describe the manner in which we'll be engaging the enemy? Sir, feet first, sir. Hoorah! The SCS Perpetua was to be a shining symbol of hope for humanity's recovery after the end of the last war. But no one had truly understood the scale of devastation that was on the horizon. Spoiled lands, divided nations, aether bombs. Civilization itself collapsed but humanity could not rely on the mercy of a short apocalypse. The inertia of that description was still carrying the corpse along through this final war. Now the Covenant plan to augment this Zeppelin with their own esoteric arcano technology and unleash it upon humanity. In the last war, Commander Colby and his alchemically augmented Sky Marshals were also looked to as symbols of hope and heroism but they would find no time to rest when the conflict had seemingly abated. The lights of democracy guttered in the wind as the Covenant cultists raised cities to the ground, leading the hard-pressed SCS command to ensure that the Sky Marshal's service would continue, culminating in this mission which could determine the outcome of the final war. They were to either claim the Perpetua themselves and turn it on the Covenant mutants, or, failing that, Detonate the atomic reactor used to power it and leave a new crater on the moon. But first, they had to take out the Covenant's Archon Sky Strikers, or else, should the dome open for the Covenant to launch the Perpetua, Rasingaman would be shredded by the Arcanotech augmented machine cannons. 
And if they had to destroy the Perpetua, they'd have no way off this rock. I'm on my way. Sir, what are you doing? I need you, Jen, and Vickers to hold this position while I secure a high-value asset. If we need help dealing with Perpetual's atomic reactor, this could be exactly what we need. Though the Sky Marshal was clearly conflicted by the sudden change in the mission's parameters, she nodded and rocketed up to higher ground to take up Overwatch with her sniper rifle. Huh? Glasman had remained silent on the Cosmocom, but transmitted a waypoint to his HUD, directing him to a nearby bunker. Two mechanized steel doors built into a thick, slanted concrete box opened as he approached, inviting him below. I'm coming in, Professor. You better have your people ready. As Colby headed down, he picked up the noise of hustle and bustle echoing up from within the vault. The sounds of dozens of feet stamping about, excited chatter, boxes and crates being moved and thumped down on the ground with haste, perhaps setting up a defensive perimeter in case of a breach. That was good. The word civilian was one that hadn't been used for years, for it had come to lose all meaning in this total, all-consuming war. At last, he arrived in the central vault chamber, its domed ceiling illuminated by small lights running along a thick wooden beam that spanned the length of the room, approximately 15 meters in diameter and crudely sectioned off with various rooms, a kitchen, living quarters, workstations, and a closed door at the far end of the room that was surrounded by candlelight. Colby tightened his grip on his rifle as he saw no sign of anyone around, yet the sound of activity persisted. The floor was scuffed with boot prints. Carpets were torn up. People had to have been here. He listened closely, slowly making his approach towards the living quarters, where the sound tracker of his triple X aerovisor seemed to be picking up the noise source, aware that every second he was spending down here meant anything could be happening on the lunar surface. Nicht schießen! Einen Moment! Professor Glassman? Yeah. I put Ewig device on your head. Let us understand each other. Professor, where the hell is everyone? You said there were civilians down here. Oh, they are here, Commander. Let us head to the chamber beyond. I think they are nearly finished. Glassman scurried over to the door, surrounded by candles, and as Colby approached, he saw that names had been scratched into the wall. Barton, Dubbo, Indicia, Magnuson. There were dozens, and Colby felt his blood run cold as Glosman smiled at him, opening a slat on the door and peering inside. 
is unfortunate we have to skip the pleasantries and get straight to business, Commander. We had hoped to delay you a little longer and that you would have brought your squad with you, but no matter. The leader of the Valiant Sky Marshals will do. What the hell have you done? They bade me offer you the chance to surrender. Those Mule and Cultist freaks, they actually made a deal with you? They came here, told me that what they truly seek is to be unbound from our moral concepts of good and evil, of laws and morals. The old ones, their technology, will lead the Covenant to their third life as man, as mutant, and as what comes next when their wisdom teaches us all new ways to revel in this great journey. Their grace will smother the earth, and with the Star Zeppelin complete, they will go on to effect universal change in time. This kindness to join them, they offer. Do you even hear yourself? How the hell did they turn you over and talk like that? We have been here for a long, long time, Commander. We offered no resistance when they came, and their prophets offered us salvation. If you wish to see the choice the others made, simply step into the radiation chamber. They're all in there, waiting. And you? They knew they would be followed here, and needed someone to delay your progress. But we can end this now. We shall step into the chamber together, join the others, and begin the great journey. this easy for you. Blood splattered the door to the radiation chamber, and Commander Colby did not look back as he exited the bunker to return to the lunar surface. The consequences of his off-mission detour were made almost immediately apparent as he arrived back where he'd ordered his team to hold position. The rocky, uneven ground was strewn with over a dozen corpses. Bulbous, unseeing eyes belonging to a group of jackal merc mutants stared blankly up at the dome over their heads, their skin sickly and pale, and Colby's wrist-mounted battle pad began updating his HUD with a tactical overview of what he'd missed. Vickers was the first of his sky marshals he saw splayed on the ground crumpled at an unnatural angle with the unmistakable markings of an arcano blade slashed across his chest. Chen was not far from him. It was clear that he had taken the same blade through the abdomen and been lifted off his feet, tossed aside like nothing. Chakova was still moving, barely. It seemed she had fallen from a great height, shot down from her overwatch position, and her armor was severely warped from the combined effect of arcanotech fire. She was injured, but in the dusty half-dark, it was impossible to know how badly. Colby hurried over, his heavy steps churning the ground. It didn't matter. The closer he got, the worse the damage looked. They both knew it was too late. Chakova shakily grasped Colby's wrist, squeezing hard until her strength failed her. And then, she was gone. Colby was alone. He stood for a moment in silent contemplation of his fallen team, not yet able to feel the loss of those with whom he'd fought for countless years, for if he were to lower that barrier now, he would surely join them. He replaced that tremor of guilt with blame, knowing he'd made a mistake going down into that bunker and that blame then transformed into responsibility. Sky Marshals, report in! Secondary target destroyed, Commander. Significant casualties sustained, but it looks like we've got the mutant bastards in retreat. Standing by for orders. Colby's visor updated with the report. Three hundred of them had dropped, 
Eighteen had died on the way down. A further two dozen had fallen in the fighting since, and the destruction of the secondary reactor complex had flash vaporized seventy-five more. We move on the primary objective, Marshal Lycan. We either claim or destroy the main facility and the Perpetua. Nothing else matters now. Affirmative, sir. We'll regroup. Marshal Iken paused as the main facility displayed signs of activity. Something was coming out of the pipes. A dark purple cloud began to spread in all directions through the dome complex, clawing its way towards the Sky Marshals like some kind of vengeful apparition. This weapon was a relatively recent development for the Covenant. For one thing, it was capable of shorting out communications equipment, but it was the effects it had on people that were said to be truly terrifying, affecting each victim differently with seemingly no logical rhyme or reason in its distinction. Despite his years of experience, Commander Colby had never actually encountered the Covenant's crawling mists before, but he had heard the stories of what these weaponized nanoclouds were capable of, and that meant he had to act fast. Colby looked down at the two fallen Sky Marshals closest to him. He'd long hated the idea of using the equipment of his fallen comrades, but that principle was just another luxury that they didn't have on the battlefield. Both Chikova and Chen had equipped their helmets with an additional attachment. The more antiquated nature of the Sky Marshal's battle rigs, systems, and design meant that only one could be equipped at a time. Chikova had opted for specialized nocturne goggles that would help with visibility, but Chen's gummy tube filter had been created as a specific countermeasure for the Covenant's crawling mists to, at least in theory, stave off some of its potential effects. Commander Colby grimaced as he pried the Nocturne goggles from Chikova's helmet and integrated it with his own. While he had never before encountered the Covenant's crawling mists, he had been in numerous situations where visibility was obscured, by smoke, by gas, by fog, and a soldier's loss of visibility could only be a recipe for disaster. Come what may when the fog rolled over his position, if he survived, he could at least navigate through it. The mists were heard before they were seen, hissing like a thousand serpents. And when the thick, purplish cloud finally reached him, vapory tendrils at the nanocloud's edges clawing in all directions, Commander Colby was ready. Engaging his jump pack, he rocketed up to the top of the damaged, two-story building Chikova had fallen from to survey the situation. He could see at least several other Sky Marshals had had the same instinct as they took up elevated overwatch positions, but many were already being smothered by the mist. As it settled into its effective radius, the hissing turned into a sizzling sound like the crackling of wood over flame. And then, the screaming began. Colby watched in horror, his nocturne goggles giving dire clarity as the nanocloud's effects took hold. Some Sky Marshals melted from within, their armor collapsing to the ground. They were the lucky ones. Others saw the reverse effects, where their armor itself was targeted for disintegration, and these once proud soldiers threw down their weapons to clumsily fumble with straps and release clamps and cast off their protection. They would be rendered almost helpless against the worst effects to come as many of those who seemed not to have been affected at all were changed from within and driven to madness. Almost as quickly as it had arrived, the nanocloud began to dissipate. Sky Marshal Aiken to all survivors. Retrieve what you can from the fallen and advance. Of 300, only 12 of their number remained. Colby recognized each and every one of them. This is it? Affirmative, Commander. We'll make it work. Supplies and ordinance? A few explosives and some spare ammunition. We're all loaded up. Not much more we can carry. 
Then the only advantage we may have is that they must think we're all dead by now. Let's show them how wrong they are. Sky Marshals, on me. Windows ran the circumference of the circular facility's highest level. The Sky Marshals found themselves in what appeared to be a small office, lined with long-abandoned desks and chairs, illuminated only by static-filled monitors. For once, it seemed fortune favored them, as the sound of the glass breaking did not alert any mutant forces, their foes no doubt occupied with the task of completing the Perpetua, augmenting the vessel with their own Arcano technology. Silently exiting the office, the Sky Marshals maneuvered across a series of high catwalks that ran the vast length of the inner facility before the Perpetua finally came into view. Its gray cylindrical frame positioned vertically like a rocket, the launch chamber had been hollowed into the moon itself to accommodate its 240 meter length. There were very few lights on, save for those which were aiding in areas of operation for the Covenant mutants, prompting Colby to scan the area with his nocturne goggles, tagging enemy positions for the other Sky Marshals to see. And that was when he saw it. And the Prophet was among them. He was not fully certain whether referring to the creature as a singular entity was correct, as this behemoth of rippling muscle adorned in a tattered red gold robe was composed of not one, but three bodies unnaturally fused together. Whether this abominable triumvirate was the product of radiation, the Covenant's arcano technology, or an unholy combination of both, Colby also wasn't sure. But the madness-inducing terror Glosman must have felt facing this thing became wholly apparent. One of its heads appeared sunken into its body, another was fixed looking upwards, and the third extended from a stretched leathery looking neck. All its eyes were fixed on the Perpetua. My brothers, now is the time of our unworlding. With this vessel, we shall follow in the footsteps of the Old Ones and burn this stinking menace in the name of our Covenant. Commander, as I see it, we've got two ways to play this. Take the ship and turn it on them, or destroy it and hope we come out of the other side alive. What are your orders? We see the mission to the end. We're launching the Perpetua. Understood. Atomic reactors have unloaded, Commander. Makes our job nice and simple. Take out the Prophet. As he finished, the ground began to rumble, but it was from above that the change came, and as dust fell from the ceiling, the diminutive mutant creatures gazed up in awe as the Great Dome initiated its opening sequence. Though the full view of the starfield beyond was still distorted by the Arcano Shield layer that effectively served as an airlock for the larger dome complex, the stars shone bright, undiminished was as close to a green light as they were going to get. FIRE! Double time, Sky Marshals! The twelve Sky Marshals followed Colby's lead as he ignited his jump pack and rocketed towards the impact site. Dodging debris and the sizzling remains of their foes, the Marshals switched to their rifles once more to open concentrated fire at the emplacements of wide-eyed jackal merc mutants on high pieces of scaffolding. One of the jackals landed a shot on Colby's jump pack with a sniper adjacent weapon that fired a deadly arcane particle, sending him careening the last seven feet to the ground. Another Sky Marshal received a similar treatment taking two hits in rapid succession. He was not as lucky. They were down to 11 now. Their advantage had run its course, as the remaining Covenant forces now began to rally and regroup, two dozen of their number emerging from the Perpetua after they'd seemingly finished hooking up the atomic reactor. Marshal Eichen was still airborne and led six of his fellows into the Star Zeppelin, another two providing covering fire on the bridge. Intent on assisting, Colby started forwards only to be slammed suddenly to the ground. Sprawled in his front, disoriented, he realized with belated certainty that he was caught in a powerful grip. Forcing himself to roll over, he saw the Prophet up closer than he ever thought he would. Its triumvirate of hideous heads all looking at him with fury and hatred. 
for a moment, he almost imagined them as the faces of Chen, Chakova, and Vickers, channeling vengeful spirits against the leader that failed them. Commander, are you aboard? The Prophet was inching closer. In the distance, one of the Sky Marshals on the bridge ah. fell into the lunar chasm below as he was hit by a series of crystalline shards. I'm not gonna make it! <laughs> Go! strength to reply, but winked a green status light on his HUD to indicate he understood. Blood poured from Colby's partially cauterized leg where the knee had been severed. The still functioning systems of his armor did what they could to pump him with enough chemicals to dull the pain, but he knew. Slipping out his sight, he had just one last thing to do. I understand. I see it so clearly. A nightmare before, now the Prophet was twisted almost beyond recognition. The leftmost head had been severed after impacting on a piece of rebar, and the rightmost head was covered in shrapnel from their earlier barrage of rockets. All that remained was its sunken center. See? What? It was not for our covenant to bring about universal ascension. Where your feathers go now. They will do that to themselves. What do you mean? It seems that the Valiant Sky Marshals will have the honor of unleashing the Old Ones themselves. Our role was simply to bring you all to... <laughs> It was only then that the last Sky Marshal on the moon allowed himself to welcome his final breath. Eleven thirty-eight hours, December 9th, 67 AP, SCS Perpetua, Unknown Space. The SCS Perpetua returned to normal space, and Sky Marshal Iken gazed at the vast sea of stars that came into focus, an enormous green-brown planet filling the lower half of the Star Zeppelin's view screen. It was impossible to tell whether they had succeeded or not. They may have stopped the Covenant mutants from claiming the Perpetua, but they were no closer to saving Earth itself. The stalemate endured. They had intended to go to the other colonies, gather what forces they could, and return home in triumph. But instead, it seemed that the Covenant had warped the atomic reactor with a predefined destination, and as the Perpetua came around the gravity well of the planet, their sensors detected a radar echo just over the horizon. Something was hidden in shadow. Rounding the dark side of the planet, the object came into view, and the sensor displays quickly began their analysis. 30,000 kilometers in diameter, the outer surface of this ring-shaped construct was an assortment of seemingly mismatched metallic plates that spread like cold webbing across layered foundation material, dark green veins engraved in ornate geometric patterns. But on the inside of the metallic wheel, a world lay within. Earth might have looked like this once, with snow-capped mountain ranges, vast grasslands, arid desert, and an even greater assortment of landscapes that none of the Sky Marshals had seen beyond their dreams. They had, it seemed, found some kind of paradise. Iken thought of Commander Colby, the last Sky Marshal to fall on Luna, giving his life so they could escape and all his other hundreds of fallen brothers and sisters. Their sacrifice had brought them to this point, and now they had not only a potentially war-ending weapon in the Perpetua, but perhaps a new home as well. Sky Marshal Iken ordered the Star Zeppelin to begin its approach to the surface.
Original stories are available on Halo Waypoint. All rights to Halo belong to 343 Industries and Microsoft. If you wish to connect with fellow fans, join us on Discord at discord.gg slash jumperscape. Support us directly by going to patreon.com slash jumperscape. Thank you for your listenership, and we hope you enjoyed.